<laughs> so I'm going to be talking about um, People Powered Money and the Trust Lines Network. My name is Eliza Howitt, and I'm from the U.S. I've been working on Trust Lines since uh, 2019. I do research in business development, and I'm based uh, partly in Germany and New York. And just a mild disclaimer that I'm going to throw around some uh, financial words, but please, um, I'm just, please don't sue us. We're just, I'm just using these words colloquially. <laughs> so, um, do, do big disclaimer. <laughs> yeah. And all right. So, oh, sorry. Um, here's our outline. I'm just going to start talking about some principles of financial inclusion to set up the frame for why we're doing this project. I'm going to then walk you through what a trust line is and how that works. I'm going to talk about the trust lines protocol, the technology stack that enables this idea, and I'm briefly going to introduce the trust lines app, the mobile app, and going to wrap it up um, by talking a bit about how this relates to the real world. So if we're interested in creating a better type of money for a more inclusive economy, we first have to define the properties of a good monetary system. Um, so first of all, money should be accessible, meaning you shouldn't need a government ID or bank account to use it. Ideally, in today's world, you should be able to access it from a mobile device. That's been working pretty well. Um, the infrastructure on which you build your monetary system should be censorship resistant so that you can trust uh, that the, the database won't get shut down or that your bank account won't get arbitrarily frozen by attackers of some sort. Um, and in addition, the system that you're using should support human-centered monetary design so that it should be um, dynamic and customizable and responsive to the needs of real communities. Um, I ideally, we should be building off the successes of local and complementary currency systems when we're thinking about how to build a better type of money. And this brings us to um, the trust lines uh, concept of people powered money, uh, which is essentially a mutual credit system based on a network of individual trust relationships. Um, and I will walk you through this now, <laughs> uh, starting with the idea of a trust line. So, what is a trust line? Trust line is two credit lines that are issued bilaterally between two people who trust each other. So here we have Alice and Bob, who are real friends, and um, Alice agrees to, she says to her friend Bob, I'm willing to loan you $10 anytime you need it. And Bob would say the same thing to Alice, they'd, they'd make it mutual. Um, and they're just willing to do that because they're friends. They really know each other. They really trust each other. So how do you use that uh, sort of agreement to make a payment? Here we see Alice decides to, well, suppose, suppose Alice and Bob go out for drinks and Bob buys Alice's drink. So now Alice owes Bob $5. Alice can pay Bob with credit over the credit line that he has given her. And that's what you see here. So Alice is issuing um, a $5 IOU to Bob, which increases the available credit for Bob and decreases the available credit for Alice. So Bob now has $15 in available credit and Alice has $5 in available credit with her friend. So what's the, what's the point of um, writing that information down. Um, we see the advantages to doing that because 
of the network effect. And so here, Alice wants to make a transaction with some guy named Charlie. <laughs> but Charlie's a stranger. Charlie doesn't know Alice, and he doesn't trust Alice with credit. He's not willing to take one of Alice's IOUs. So Alice actually can do this cool thing where she looks at the network of people using trust lines, and she finds a path of connected trust lines between her and Charlie so that she can make a payment with them. Here, um, Bob actually ends up being the mutual friend with Alice and with Charlie. And Bob has, um, Bob has a trust line with both of them um, for the same amount. So Alice, here she sees, if she wants to spend a five dollars with Charlie, she can say uh, to Bob, "I owe you five dollars," and Bob can say to Charlie, "I owe you five dollars as well." So this is how um, we call this a multi-hop payment. You could also say that you're rippling a transaction through the network, uh, but Bob in this situation. The cool thing is that his net balance remains unchanged. He's totally unaffected by this transaction. And um, Alice is able to issue an IOU to a, to a stranger, but Charlie, the stranger, ends up um, having credit from somebody he trusts. So, so Charlie ends up holding credit from Bob, and Bob ends up holding uh, extra credit from Alice. So before the transaction, Bob had 10 credits with Alice and 10 credits with Charlie, and now he's got uh, 15 credits with Alice and five credits with Charlie. It still adds up to 20, so he's net zero. These uh, multi-hop payments function like a payment in kind. Charlie is agreeing to the sale because he's receiving additional credit in a uh, a trust line he finds valuable with a person that he trusts. So no one in this interaction is ever having to deal with credit with somebody that they didn't personally decide to trust. So the you might wonder, well, what happens when you know when Alice or Bob maxes out their credit line with their friends? Uh, how do they settle? Wouldn't that make this whole thing? Um, uh, kind of useless. So in actuality, when there's a system with many participants, um, money flows both directions. It circulates. And so here we see that Bob, um, you know, who previously had credit with Charlie, may now decide that he wants to transact with Dave. And so what he would do is he, um, just like with Alice rippling credit to Charlie, Bob can ripple credit to Dave through Charlie, their mutual friend. So Bob here would say, um, would, uh, yeah, would decrease that balance with Charlie and in re return Charlie would ripple that $5 to Dave. So Dave ends up plus five and uh, Bob and Charlie are back down to zero, but Charlie is still net zero in this transaction. So why not cheat the system? Why not create a bunch of fake accounts with fake credit to use in the network? And here's Eve. Eve has created credit lines with herself of millions of dollars. But what we see is that um, this kind of attack doesn't work because Eve, Eve's spending ability with the network is ultimately constrained by the credit limit that her real friends have given her. So Alice and Eve, they know each other in real life, and Alice trusts Eve with 10 bucks, but she doesn't trust Eve with $10 million. And, um, in, you know, either with Eve's multiple personalities, either Alice doesn't know them or doesn't trust that they're really, you know, unique people, or she knows that it's just Eve trying to, trying to dupe her. So... Alice is not going to open a credit line of $10 million with Eve or with any of Eve's multiple personalities. <laughs> um, 
This is a, a fault tolerant system. So you can look at this network of mutual credit and ask the question, is this money? Uh, I think it is. I think um, you could say that this is an alternative medium of exchange um, that anybody can issue. And the cool thing about it is it's created as needed by its users. It obtains its value from real world trust relationships and it's accessible to anyone with a friend. So what that means really is you could make payments with any any device like a mobile phone that connects you to your friends. Um, so you could say in this world that there are different fundamental types of money. One is government money, which would be like the physical cash you might have in your wallet, dollar bills or euros, paper money. Um, or another type different from the first is bank money. That would be like the money in your bank account. Um, so even though it may be denominated in dollars or euros, it's really just a formalized IOU from the bank. It's, it's credit that the bank owes you. And then there's also commodity money. So anything with intrinsic value like gold or some would argue that Bitcoin is a type of commodity money. And then there's people powered money. So that would be like if you and your friends go out for drinks and your buddy pays for your beer, you can say, okay, I owe you a beer. <laughs> and that, that agreement that you make between you and your friend, that debt that you owe, is a type of money. Uh, we may not think about, that way, about it that way um, normally, but it's a medium of exchange just like any of the others. No, now, um, the idea of people-powered money is fundamentally different from the rest because you don't have to consult any central authority to create and use that money, and you're not uh, benefiting anyone either. And this is something that we're, we're working towards with this project. Okay, I'm going to talk about TrustLine's protocol now. Um, TrustLine's protocol, it consists of four components. There's the TrustLine's uh, blockchain, uh, minimum viable proof of stake sidechain, Ethereum. There are, uh, there's the smart contract system, which stores all the business logic, uh, the relay servers and optional service, which um, will calculate the optimal paths for routing transactions through the network and the client library, high level API for interacting with, with the smart contracts, via the relay server um, on the blockchain. And TrustLine's protocol, it's a free open source technology stack um, designed to solve obstacles to financial inclusion. It is, uh, notably, it is agnostic to the idea of people powered money. It can be used for any use case you can imagine by anybody. Uh, the blockchain runs uh, with anonymous validators. Uh, this is a pretty important feature of it. And the, the validators earn rewards for each block they create and each transaction they include, uh, denominated in the native token of the TrustLine's blockchain. Uh, the validators have to stake ETH on the main chain uh, first to become a validator. And the validators are responsible for uh, running a node with high uptime. You shouldn't attack the network. You should monitor the chain for misbehavior and participate in governance. Uh, if you want to be a validator, you got to register for the auction. And by the way, the next one is in July. Uh, wait for further instructions, then you'd send your ETH address to get anonymized, um, participate in the auction, and hopefully win. And uh, if you want to exit, you would either get slashed, which is not recommended, or automatically exit after a fixed period, at which point you'd get your stake back. 
So one really important point is um, to explain how, how can new users join the TrustLines network without buying TrustLines coins. Um, and they would do this using the delegate service contract. So delegates are set up to pay transaction fees uh, on behalf of the end user in exchange for fees set in the smart contract system. Um, or they do this for free out of uh, community loyalty. But let's talk about how they would accept credit instead. So here's Alice. Uh, she wants to join the TrustLines network, but she doesn't have any TLC or any other crypto. She's never heard of crypto before. Um, she would find a delegate who's willing to pay her fee and in exchange, the delegate would accept a currency network fee. So that means uh, Alice's credit denominated in the currency network that she's choosing to use. It would be like the delegate is accepting Alice's personal IOUs. Um, so this is how it happens. Uh, Alice and delegate would both sign the transaction and the currency network registers that Alice owes the delegate a currency network so why would a delegate do this? Um, as I mentioned before, they might do it for free out of community loyalty, uh, since transaction costs are pretty cheap anyway. Um, but they could also do this as um, an investment. You know, if the if the delegate believes that the currency network is going to be valuable and that Alice's credit is worth something, and they can use that credit to pay somebody else in the network at some point. Um, then sure, why not? Why not do that? Um, it's just uh, an exchange like any other. So this brings us to the TrustLines app. I'm happy to announce that we've got the TrustLines app live right now. If you go to TrustLines.app, you can try it out, um, ideally with a friend. Uh, First you download it, then you'd create a trust line with a friend, and then you'd be able to interact with anyone in your community who's connected to you. So you can see it's a really easy onboarding process. And there are other cool features about it too. So um, when you open the app, you'll see that there's 40-something uh, currency networks. Um, currency networks are very customizable. You can, uh, they can have different denominations. So there will be different currency networks with um, denominated in euros and dollars, but there's also Bitcoin and time and even a currency network for beers. We also got um, our first uh, community member launched currency network, which is the favors community network. So you can transact with favors now as well. Um, other things that can be customized are the user group. You can make it open or closed. You can add an interest rate to your currency network, whether it be positive or negative. And negative interest rates are a really uh, cool feature that have been used in some complementary currency designs, um, like the Chiemgauer in southern Germany. Um, and you can also restrict the number of trust lines that each user has if uh, that's something that you're going for. Uh, so to bring it back to where we started, um, I hope I have shown that the uh, trust lines protocol is super accessible. This concept of people powered money also it's super accessible. A trust line is a really accessible financial tool and uh, you can do a lot with it. And uh, the TrustLines protocol itself is censorship resistant um, based on our anonymous validators and uh, blockchain system. And the app is uh, allows you to experiment with different types of currencies um, and it's really customizable so you can, uh, it really supports this idea of human-centered monetary design. In today's world, we've got about 2 billion P 
people who are excluded from the banking system, um, but a lot of these people already have mobile phones. And so this is an idea that could make a difference to these people. Um, I also just wanna make a note about the current, the pandemic that we're dealing with right now, which is leading us into a global recession, uh, which means scarce money. Um, but the damage that is being done is kind of specific. Uh, as Dill Green wrote recently, um, Dill Green of Open Credit Network. Um, so there's fewer workers and increased distribution costs, but all the resources are still there. Um, we've got the same machinery, roads, computers, etc., and consumers have all the same wants and needs. So we've got plenty of workers willing to work and plenty of resources still. Um, we can expect that the thing which will exacerbate this crisis is actually, in fact, a scarcity of money, um, a failure in the infrastructure that provides a medium of exchange. And that's the exact problem that mutual credit can solve. Um, we've seen how it can work already with the successes of the Veer Bank in Switzerland during the, the Great Depression, and more recently with Sardex in Italy after the 2008 crash. Um, and that's kind of what we envision with uh, this idea of people-powered money on the Trust Lines network. Um, it's something that we can get started and do right away without, without any, you know, without asking our governments for anything. We can just go ahead and start using people-powered money. <laughs> um, so I invite you with that to join the community, uh, download the app, try it out, let us know what you think. And um, I think I'll open up to questions if I have any. <laughs> Thanks guys. Any questions? I guess you were super clear. Yeah, guess, um, Thank you so much. Is about Appreciate adoption. Your time. Like, I feel like there's been a lot of attempts like this over the last three years to create new forms of money, new forms of peer-to-peer um, -peer money. Um, why would this one succeed where the other ones have not succeeded? That would be my question. Like, what is it that you're doing in the area of adoption to make sure that this um, becomes something that's that's you know that's used by people? Well, I'm interested in any suggestions you might have. Um, <laughs> I think that the idea is pretty compelling to me. And um, I think maybe one of our challenges is uh, explaining the concept um, to people in a way that they can uh, trust it, you know. Can you talk more about... Um... A settlement and what happens if someone like um, like uh, I guess defaults on their their credit loan in a sense uh, okay so so I like to talk about the idea of social collateral because with um, the trust line system when you when you open a trust line with your friend it's um, it's not collateralized in the traditional sense it's just your reputation with your friend. And so if if I open up a credit line, you know, with my friend and my friend pays for my beers and or something and I, I just never pay him back, then you know that's I'm just burning that bridge with uh, your friend. I uh, got it. Okay. There's no <laughs> that's super cool. For that. <laughs> Except No, that makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So it's more like that the, the credit is denominated in something like B or USD. It's not literally USD that can be like called upon. No, but um, no, it's just informal agreements between right. people who really know each other. But you can use it like that. Like you can, one of the, um, like you could use it like a human ATM. <laughs> so I could pay you IOUs <laughs> in trust lines if you, you know, to take out to withdraw some cash from you. Um, something like that could work. Very cool. Thank you. <laughs>